All right, good afternoon. We will call our May 29th meeting of TASSER to order. Uh, the first tab, welcome by the way, everyone on this beautiful May afternoon. Uh, unfortunately, our chairman, Senator Yeager, is not able to be with us and they've called in the B League uh, to help with the meeting today. For, for Brooks. For B for Brooks. Uh, the minutes of the January meeting is tab one and without objection, we will uh, accept those as presented. Uh, I see no objection. Thank you. Tab two, uh, commission and staff update, Dr. Lippard, welcome. Th thank you, Chairman. So uh, members, you'll recall at our last meeting, we announced our grand plan to shift to an electronic format for the docket books. Um, and we are still shifting. Uh, we've run into some technical and logistical issues on that. So we are continuing with, as you can tell in front of you, the, the printed docket books for this meeting. I'm the, the guinea pig with, uh, with an iPad for this meeting. Um, we hope to have completed the shift by the next meeting. Of course, as, as I said last meeting, if you want to continue to receive a, a, a or have a printed version of the docket book, we, we're happy to do that. Or if, um, what we're going to do is we're going to once we identify the right product, we're going to have some uh, tablets available. But if you want, to, if you prefer to use your own tablet, that's fine also. So if you want a printed docket book in the future or want to use your own device, please just let April know sometime this meeting, and so we make sure we we have the count correct, and we'll continue to to work on the the technical side of that. Uh, right. So moving on to staff updates. Um, we have uh, a couple of accomplishments. Uh, Research Director David Lewis and Senior Research Associate Presley Powers have both completed TASSER's Learning Pyramid. Again, this is the four-stage uh, pyramid that's modeled on the Department of Human Resources training program. It's an extensive program. And, this, and I think uh, David and, and Presley are five and six, I think, of the staff to complete. David, Presley, if you could stand, please. And congratulations. And then also, uh, we, are, we are very happy. Again, this year, we have two interns uh, working with us this summer, and we uh, both uh, from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville's Baker School of Public Policy and Public Affairs, uh, Cameron Fox and Emma Stanley, if you could both stand, please. Emma on, in, the, in the gray and Cameron in the white. And that completes the commission and staff update, Mr. Chairman. Melissa Brown and the fiscal year 23-24 accomplishments. Dr. Brown, we look forward to those. Oh, I'm not a doctor. There, we, we have too many PhDs in here for me to take it, but thank you. <laughs> and it's good to see you, Mr. Chairman. So as the chairman said, I'm Melissa Brown, Deputy Executive Director. I'll be going over the 2023-24 accomplishments for that fiscal year behind tab three in your docket book. And just from the start, I wanna let you know, this is for informational purposes only, there's no action required by the commission. All of this information will be included in our next biennial report, which should be ready at our next commission meeting. So taking a look at page one, since July of 2023, the commission has published six official reports. These, these are listed in the bulleted items below. I wanna call special attention to the fourth and fifth bulleted items because these are statutorily required annual reports. And that is our annual TVA authority payment in lieu of taxes report and the annual infrastructure report. Turning to page two of the memo, I wanna give you a brief overview of the reports that have been completed and some of the recommendations. And I'd like to note that, that the General Assembly has already taken action on a number of recommendations that were in the report. And Hannah Newcomb will cover these as part of the legislative update, which is behind tab four in your docket book. So the first re uh, commission report that was released that we're gonna discuss is the solar report that was in response to public chapter 1043 acts of 2022. It directed the commission to study issues stemming from the development of utility scale solar facilities in Tennessee, as well as concerns related to consumer protection in the residential solar market. The report recommended that the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, the Office of Energy Programs, continue to expand and maintain its existing website with additional guidance and resources about residential and utility scale solar for everyone, local governments, developers, the public, 
Also, the report recommends that the state consider raising the penalty for violations of the Consumer Protection Act if the good or service involved has a, <clears throat> excuse me, a value greater than a monetary threshold set by the state. And this was to be done without undermining uh, the General Assembly's past efforts at tort reform. A copy of the final report was shared with both speakers, all members of the General Assembly, and is posted to the Commission's website. The next report was on College E911, the routing and storage of emergency communications on the campuses of colleges and universities in Tennessee. This was in response to, response to Senate Bill 2827 by Senator Hensley and House Bill 2729 by Representative Ogles from the 112th General Assembly. The report recommended that the General Assembly require colleges and universities to publish to their websites annual statistics for complaints of sexual misconduct and assault that had been reported to their Title IX authorities, that the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation develop a process to include statistics for re crimes reported within one half mile of each college or university campus in its annual Crime on Statistics report, and that the schools publish to their websites the statistics for the institutions from this report, and all of that data is supposed to be available on request anyway. The report also recommended that the state encourages schools to record and retain recordings of <clears throat> calls to campus police and security departments by providing additional funding to help these institutions obtain or improve emergency call recording systems. Next was a report on the liquor by the drink tax and restaurant regulations, which was in response to Senate Bill 2262 by Senator Briggs and House Bill 2419 by Representative Manis, again in the 112th General Assembly. The commission was asked to study the liquor by the drink and similar taxes for on-premise consumption of alcohol and restaurant regulations in Tennessee. The, you recommended in your report that the Tennessee Alcohol Beverage Commission inform applicants that it does accept temporary occupancy use permits for liquor license applications and that Strategic Technology Solutions Office continue to find ways to automate the application process. And this report, along with the others, both were sent to both speakers, all members of the General Assembly, and published to the Commission's website. Now, the next staff's completed a report on the housing cost and ways to improve affordability. Dr. Strickland is going to present the final report later this afternoon for your approval, so I won't review this. Uh, I don't want you to have to listen to the same information over and over again. So allow Dr. Strickland to present that final report to you for approval. Moving on to page four, staff also produced three staff reports. The first was uh, part two of a two-part series related to the effect of the COVID-19 recession on public infrastructure needs. The first interim report was released in September of 2021, and it examined the infrastructure data collected during the Great Recession, and we looked at it over a 10-year period so we could establish a baseline for analyzing data collected during the COVID pandemic itself. And then the current report looked at whether or to what extent the pandemic had affected infrastructure needs reported in Tennessee as of July 1, 2021. With the exception of K-12 education technology, the report found that the pandemic had little effect on reported needs. Next, at the bottom of page four, staff updated the Fiscal Capacity User's Guide following the state's adoption of the K-12 education funding formula. And just to note, nothing about our model changed. This was just to update how uh, TASSER model will be used uh, with the TISA funding formula. Going on to page five, staff provided six presentations over the past year. David Lewis and Jennifer uh, Berry presented to the Tennessee Valley Solar and Storage Conference related to the solar report, uh, a policy update, and the results of the TASSER study and policy implications. Next, Bob Morio and David Lewis presented to the Nashville chapter of the Association of Government Accountants regarding electric vehicles and other issues that affect road and highway funding. Doctors Lippert and Owen presented to Senate Finance Ways and Means, the expansion of broadband coverage in Tennessee, an update on that information. Next, Dr. Lippert presented to the American Institute of Architects, our TASSER study, Housing Affordability, Impact Fees, and Development Taxes. Michael Mount presented a summary of our January 2018 report encouraging more cooperation and accountability in payment in lieu of tax agreements to the Shelby County Board of Commissioners. And finally, Dr. Strickland presented to the Tennessee County Services Association their legislative uh, conference 
uh, affordable housing and development tools for county governments. Over the past year, staff has responded to requests for information and assistance from members of the General Assembly and legislative committees. An example of this, if you'll recall, at our January meeting, uh, Senior Research Director <coughs> Leah Eldridge presented regarding uh, a request from Senator Lundberg regarding judicial redistricting. Staff also over the year has responded to information and assistance requests from local government officials, state agencies, the public, and the media. Over the past year, staff has administered 10 contracts. None of these are with the development districts related to the public infrastructure needs inventory and continuing our partnership with Middle Tennessee State University regarding the economic indicators website. Starting on page six, all the reports that I just discussed are just categorized by policy area. And then moving on to page seven, looking toward the bottom, using technology for public information. This is where I always like to give a shout out to Teresa Gibson and Mark Patterson for all their work at continuing to make the data more readily available in a usable manner to both members of the public, the General Assembly, but also researchers so that they can look at it and, and advance on that information. We continue to disseminate all reports electronically and we continue to update the focus sections of our TASR webpage. Uh, you recently heard a presentation about the upgrades to our fiscal federalism portion of the website, which we hope to have that updated uh, not too long from now. And going forward, it will be easier for staff to update that information annually. And then on page nine, you're going to see a sheet that shows the web analytics. This shows the different sections of the website and how frequently each is visited. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report and happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Executive Director. Um, any questions from the commission? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one question on page five, those six presentations there in the middle of the page, are they available on the website? They are not, I don't believe. No, they are not, but we could send you one. That'd be great. Okay, and that's a good idea. Maybe that's something we look at going forward. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions from the commission? Thank you so much. All right, thank you. That takes us to the very next tab, which is tab four, legislative update from Hannah Newcomb. Welcome. Hi. Okay. Thank you and good afternoon. As mentioned, this is the legislative update for 2024, which can be find, found behind tab four in your docket book. Um, as usual, the legislative update consists of two parts. In the first part, I will review the legislation that came before the General Assembly um, this session that's related to the work that TASR has done in the past. And for the second part of the update, I will cover requests for new studies from the commission. To, to begin with the topic of annexation and land use, Public Chapter 701, Acts of 2024, was passed, changing the requirement for public notices relating to annexation or municipal zoning to be published, posted, or mailed from 15 days to 21 days before a public hearing on the annexation or zoning. Uh, this legislation takes up a recommendation from the Commission's 2015 report, Community Land Based, excuse me, Community Based Land Use Decisions, Public Participation in the Rezoning Process. Senate Bill 2895 by Senator Bailey and House Bill 2071 by Representative Williams um, would have also revised existing annexation laws by adding specific circumstances in which a referendum would not be pa required to carry out the annexation of territory, but the bill did not pass. Moving on to broadband internet access, a topic that has been revisited by the commission with notable reports in both 2017 and 2021, Senate Bill 2907 by Senator Bailey and House Bill 2910 by Representative Alexander would have expanded on prior legislation by requiring broadband equity, access, and deployment grant recipients that received other state or federal funding to provide broadband services in the state to submit a biannual report um, to the Department of Economic and Community Development containing a list of locations that remain unserved and a date the provider plans to serve these locations. Um, the bill passed in the Senate but was deferred to summer study by the House Commerce Committee. Next, on the topic of community, community resilience, several pieces of legislation were considered directly relating to the Commission's recommendation in this 2020 report 
collaborating to improve community resiliency to natural disasters, that the state should ensure that ongoing resilience efforts, including collaboration among state agencies and local governments, continue. Public Chapter 686, Acts of 2024, was enacted this session, which establishes the Resilient Tennessee Revolving Fund Act, which requires money through, received through FEMA and the Federal Storm Act to be used to provide loans administered by TEMA at an interest rate of 1% or less to eligible recipients, or to provide loans and financial assistance to recipients that mitigate the impacts of natural hazards. Um, this legislation also requires TEMA to publish information about funded projects online. Senate Bill 2286 by Senator Oliver and House Bill 2236 by Representative Powell would have created the Tennessee Natural Disaster Resiliency Act and formed a task force responsible for reviewing the state's preparedness and ability to respond to natural disasters. Um, the bill did not advance out of the committee in the House or Senate. Now onto the topic of criminal statutes of limitations. Um, Public Chapter 644, Acts of 2024, which as amended, extends the statute of limitations for bringing a civil suit for an injury or illness that is the result of a sexual assault to three years from the date of the assault if law enforcement was notified, or to five years from the date of the assault if law enforcement was, excuse me, if law enforcement was notified when the injured person is at least 18 years old. Criminal statutes of limitations was the focus of the commission's December 2018 report, refining Tem Tennessee's criminal statutes of limitations, in which the commission recommended similar changes to the statute of limitations on child sexual assault and other offenses. Next on GPS monitoring. In 2020, the commission's report, Improving Victim Safety with Global Positioning System GPS Monitoring as a Condition of Release for Defendants Accused of Domestic Violence, um, the commission recommended that local governments using GPS monitoring for pretrial defendants consider prioritizing certain types of offenses, including those involving domestic violence. Senate Bill 1972 by Senator Rose and House Bill 2692 by Representative Doggett is consistent with this recommendation by requiring an offender in violation of an order of protection or arrested for the offense of stalking, domestic violence, or sexual assault to wear a GPS device. The bill also offers victims of these offenses the option to use an application on their phone or an electronic receptor device to notify them if the offender is close by. Um, the bill has passed both chambers. Public Chapter 874, Acts of 2024, makes it a Class B misdemeanor when a person knowingly tampers with, removes, or vandalizes a GPS monitoring device that the person is required to use as a condition of bond, probation, or parole. Similarly, Senate Bill 2412 by Senator Lamar and House Bill 2514 by Representative Harris would have required defendants charged with certain fel felony level offenses like aggravated robbery that are released on their own recognizance or on an unsecured appearance bond while awaiting trial to wear a GPS monitoring device. The bill was taken off notice in the House and did not advance out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. Moving on to our next topic, housing affordability. Uh, later today, you'll hear Dr. Strickland um, review this report for your consideration, um, but we'll go over a couple of these bills now. So the session, this session, the General Assembly considered several bills related to the study. Senate Bill 1137 by Senator Oliver and House Bill 1229 by Representative Himmer, which passed in both chambers, enables cities and counties to fund industrial development boards for multifamily affordable housing, provided certain preconditions set by the comptroller are met. Public Chapter 956, Acts of 2024, grants industrial development boards and counties with expected high job growth the powers to support infrastructure development for housing. Public Chapter 971, Acts of 2024, which is listed in tab four as Senate Bill 1000 by Senator Yeager and House Bill 1046 by Representative Vaughn, enacts the Tennessee Rural, Rural and Workforce Housing Act, which authorizes the Tennessee Housing Development Agency to provide the owner of an eligible project with a credit against taxpayer liability for any tax imposed by the law relevant to insurance, excise tax law, or franchise tax law. Public Chapter 860, Acts of 2024, creates a uniform procedure for establishing infrastructure development districts, which can serve as an alternative funding and financing option for capital infrastructure through the <coughs> levying collection of special assessments. Several other bills addressing zoning and building permits were considered this session but were taken off notice, including 
Senate Bill 2237 by Senator Yarbrough and House Bill 2423 by Representative Shaw, which would have enacted a variant of a recommendation from the Commission's Housing Affordability Report and incentivize local governments to adopt zoning reforms for housing by allowing them 5% of their recreation tax revenues for each zoning reform they adopted out of a list of 14, up to a maximum of 20%. Senate Bill 2238 by Senator Yarbrough and House Bill 2467 by Representative Stevens, as amended, would have offered tax credits to residents affected by zoning reforms on existing residents' property taxes. A later amendment narrowed this to use by counties with a metropolitan form of government. Now onto the subject of littering. The Commission's 2020 report, Closing Gaps in Tennessee's Waste Tire Program and Giving Local Governments More Flexibility pr to Prevent Illegal Tire Dumping, assessed ways to mitigate and reduce illegal tire dumping in the state and made recommendations for the prevention of dumping. This year, Public, Act, Public Chapter 614, Acts of 2024, enacted several of these recommendations by expanding the permitted uses for money received by a county for each tire sold to include the removal of illegally disposed waste tires from public or private property. Um, it also authorized ECD to provide funds to local governments for the investigation and cleanup of properly owned, unpermitted waste tire disposal sites and required waste haulers to, excuse me, waste tire haulers to register with the ECD and display an active department issue decal or placard. Moving on to passenger rail. Last year, the commissioner completed its report back on track, inner city passenger rail options for Tennessee, which addressed the feasibility of passenger rail in the state. In its recommendation, in its report, the commission ultimately recommend, recommended that a state office of rail and public transportation be established. This year, the General Assembly enacted Public Chapter 679, Acts of 2024, which as it was originally, which as it was originally written, would have created an Office of Rail and Public Transportation, but instead requires TDOT to submit an annual report detailing the progress of public transit and passenger and freight rail at the state and federal level beginning in January 2025. Next, we move on to the topic of precious metal depositories. In December 2021, the Commission finalized its report exploring the feasibility of a gold depository in Tennessee, which recommended against the formation of a state-backed gold depository. This session, Public Chapter 69, Acts of 2024, was passed, allowing the state treasurer to purchase and sell gold or precious metal bullion or specie directly owned by the state and kept in the custody of the state treasurer. Two additional bills were introduced this session but did not pass. Senate Bill 26... 01 by Senator Nicely and House Bill 2799 by Representative Holsley would have established a state depository with the option to be used as an exclusive or non-exclusive storage base of precious metals. Senate Bill 2735 by Senator Nicely and House Bill 2803 by Representative Holsley would have authorized the state treasurer through the use of a third party to securely produce, store, process, and ship bullion products for a state depository with the intent of producing a state mint. And again, those bills did not pass. Up next is the subject of taxes. The professional privilege tax in Tennessee, which is the issue discussed in the commission's 2016 report, professional privilege tax in Tennessee, taxing professionals fairly, was once again the subject of several bills. In its report, the commission did not make a specific recommendation on eliminating the privilege tax, but it did note that eliminating the tax entirely would cost the state an estimated 88 million per year. Senate Bill 1944 by Senator Crow and House Bill 2855 by Representative Hill, if it had passed, would have completely repealed the professional privilege tax um, beginning on and after June 1st, 2025. Senate Bill 2816 by Senator Reeves and House Bill 2627 by Representative Baum, if it had passed, would have also repealed the professional privilege tax beginning in any year after May 31st, 2025. Senate Bill 1841 by Senator Wally and House Bill 2586 by Representative Russell would have altered the implementation of the privilege tax by suspending it for any year in which the previous year saw the state general fund tax revenue over collections exceed $500 million. The bill was taken off notice in the House and failed to advance out of the state, excuse me, out of the Senate Finance Ways and Means Committee. Lodging taxes and their effect on the state's hospitality and tourism industry which is the subject of the Commission's 2016 report, structuring lodging taxes to, prever to preserve the economy and encourage tourism, was likewise the subject of several pieces of legislation cons considered this session. Senate Bill 1676 by Senator 
Briggs and House Bill 2240 by Representative Cochran make suggestions to the stipulations of the hotel motel tax by requiring municipalities that levy the tax to submit an annual report disclosing how that tax revenue was used. In the 2009 staff report, Greenbelt revised, excuse me, revisited several issues with the state's Greenbelt law were identified and recommended changes to the use of rollback taxes um, were recommended relating to the subject of Senate Bill 2218 by Senator Powers and House Bill 1902 by Representative Burkhart, which would have required Greenbelt rollback taxes to be paid in full at closing when Greenbelt property is sold. Moving on to our next topic, utilities. Public Chapter 705, Acts of 2024, which adopts one of the Commission's recommendations from its 2023 report, Managing Solar Development, Solar Energy Development to Balance Private Property Rights and Consumer Protection with the Protection of Land and Communities to require the Office of Energy Programs at TDEC to expand and maintain its existing website. The legislation also requires all solar power facilities um, agreements to provide a disconnection plan for the solar power facility at the end of its useful life. Public Chapter 820, Acts of 2024, authorizes the Tennessee Board of Utility Regulation to set a cost-sharing arrangement between a property owner and a utility if the two parties are unable to agree upon an arrangement for the construction of off-site utility improvements to maintain capacity. Um, finally, moving on to our last topic, water and outdoor recommendation, or <laughs> outdoor recreation. Um, this session, Public Chapter 845, Acts of 2024 permits the executive director of the Fish and Wildlife Commission to establish a temporary slow no-wake zone as necessary when there is an immediate danger to the public health, environment, safety, or welfare and requires notice of the slow no-wake zone to be published at least once in a locally circulated newspaper. And this legislation aligns with the previous commission report um, managing Tennessee's public waterways for recreation, balancing access, safety, and protection of natural resources. Um, and the recommendation was that stakeholders and agencies should take a collaborative approach to handle user conflicts and access to the waterways. Okay, finally, we turn to the second part of the update to discuss the requests for new studies. This year, the General Assembly passed five pieces of legislation directing the Commission to conduct four new studies because two of these pieces of legislation were combined into one study. Um, the Commission will also hear requests for two additional studies based on bills that, that did not pass in both chambers, along with one request that we received by letter. Public Chapter 938, Acts of 2024, which is sponsored by Senator Watson and Representative Williams, requires the commission to study the state and local laws, regulations, and rules that govern the startup, operation, and expansion of childcare businesses in the state. And the public chapter requires the commission to submit a report of its findings by January 31st, 2025. Public Chapter 934, Acts of 2024, also requires the Commission to study the child care landscape in the state, including the current makeup of child care workers, the feasibility and impact of implementing a program that covers the cost of child care for child care workers, and the feasibility and impact of incentivizing child care workers through expanding financial supports for early educators in the benefits cliff. Um, Senate Bill 1140 by Senator Lumberg and House Bill 886 by Representative Hawk directs the Commission to conduct a study of the collection and remittance of local sales tax collected at the point of sale by businesses in the state and requires the Commission to submit a report of its findings by January 31st, 2025. Public Chapter 941, Acts of 2024, sponsored by Representative Parkinson, requires the Commission to study real estate fraud in the state, including its prevalence, schemes used to commit real estate fraud, and methods used by other states to combat real estate fraud. Um, Public Chapter 937, Acts of 2024, instructs the Commission to conduct a study on the effects of vaping and the use of all vapor products by persons under 21. The study must identify the prevalence of vaping amongst youth, including demographic information and usage trends, and the Commission must submit a report disclosing its findings no later than January 31st, 2025. Senate Bill 2877 by Senator Kyle and House Bill 2961 by Representative Hardaway would have required the Commission, with the assistance of the TBI, the District Attorney's General Conference, and the Department of Safety, to study the feasibility of a crime lab in Shelby County and its potential impact on public health, safety, education, housing, and the economy. 
Um, though the legislation was passed by the Senate, it was taken off notice in the House. Uh, moving on, during the second session of the 112th General Assembly, Public Chapter 695, Acts of 2022, was enacted, which permitted certain medical disciplines that provide services in school districts across the state to eligible 10 care students to acquire the necessary credentials needed to receive reimbursement claims to centers for Medicare and Medicaid services through the appropriate managed care organizations. Unresolved contractual issues have resulted in some school systems being unable to seek reimbursement for school-based services provided to students covered by TenCare. Having been, away to, made, having been made aware of these issues, Senator Lumberg introduced Senate Bill 2487, and Rep Representative Sherrill introduced House Bill 2616 during the 113th General Assembly. While the bill did not advance, Senator Lumberg, Representative White, and Representative Sherrill sent a letter on April 3rd, 2024, to formally request that the commission review this problem and assist the parties involved in reaching a resolution. And finally, the Senate Finance Ways and Means Committee has referred the subject to Senate Bill 2054 by Senator Jackson and House Bill 2205 by Representative Barrett to the commission for study. The bill, which had previously passed in the House, would have established that the District Attorney General will only prosecute cases in municipal court courts where the municipality provides at least one assistant district attorney general position and other necessary prosecutorial personnel. <laughs> okay, so that concludes the legislative update and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Also, I'd like to note that next in tab four, Deputy Executive Director Melissa Brown will go over the work amendment where you'll actually vote on um, the study requests received by the commission. will be Melissa Brown. And um, any questions from the commission on this very good legislative update? Senator first and then. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for that long um, presentation. I know it was a slog, so I appreciate it. Um, a, a couple of questions. Um, one, um, these are random sort of, I mean, I know of legislation in all of these categories that was not mentioned, mm -hmm. for example. Um, how do you determine what uh, legislation you're going to assess and, and report to us? Thank you for the question. So there's, like you said, so many pieces of legislation. Um, and not everything that I mentioned just now, like reading out, um, is included, or excuse me, everything I read is included in the actual memo, the tab four. Um, but some of them that, I, that are in the memo, I did not actually say out loud. So some of them may be in the written memo. Um, otherwise, you know, we determine what goes into tab four um, based on the how closely it relates to the prior studies that we've we've produced at TASER um, and how well they relate to a recommendation. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah. Um, I so I mean I would think that the franchise excise tax, which was by every measure the largest uh, thing that we passed this year, would have been under our taxes, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were a lot of things that I guess could fall under passenger rail, littering, those sorts of categories that, um, you know, I did feel were important. Um, so, um, yeah, so I just, I, I was just curious how that how that process played out. Um, with, um, with the ones that you reported in the second part of this, I'm assuming um, that, that there are some that did not pass that we're taking up, like public health and safety 2877, for example. How, because um, I think there were several requests for TASR studies that, that didn't pass. How did, how did, the, um, how did TASR uh, staff decide on those? Um, to my knowledge, we included the ones that we were, were made aware of. Um, sometimes some of them do um, happen through an amendment or through something else that we may not have been made aware of. But if you have um, an idea of some of those, we'd be happy to take a look at them and include them. Um, and also back to the, maybe some of them missing in the written tab four, um, we're always happy to go back and make changes and update the online version of tab four. But like I mentioned, sometimes things get um, lost, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, and I'm not really chastising so much as trying to understand the process right. and um, it's sure. a lot of information. Senator, Director Lippard would like to respond, oh. and then Commissioner. 
So our, the, the way we normally handle it, Senator, is uh, we have tiers, if you will, of, of studies that, that we've included in tab five, and Melissa will be going over those shortly. Anything that, of course, passes, if it's a public chapter or is passing, is waiting to be chaptered, uh, is the first tier. Uh, after that is anything that's been referred by both chambers. So uh, referred, uh, could be just referred in committee, or in some cases passed in one chamber and referred, by, referred in the other chamber. And then after that is anything that was either just uh, referred by one chamber would be would be the lowest tier. Then you have some exceptions that, such as letters requesting a study, or of course if one of the speakers requests a study. And, that's, and those are the ways that studies come to us normally from the legislature. Gotcha. Thank you, uh, Senator. Is it a follow up, or can we go to the commissioner? She was next. Uh, a follow up to the director. Certainly. Um, Director, just basically, the Senator also mentioned F&E taxes. I don't recall any discussion on F&E uh, tax study by TASSER. No legislation was filed. I don't remember any discussion on that. You wouldn't arbitrarily just pick something out to study, correct? That, that's correct. Uh, there have been times in the past where we will do a, a staff study. Uh, the, even in those cases, we notify the, the commission that we're, we're, we're studying an issue. And that's only if there's a, an issue that we believe is, is emerging. But we haven't, we haven't done a study, as far as I recall, on F&E taxes directly uh, probably in 15, 20 years. And I would have to, I'd have to really stretch to find what that recommendation was, if there were any. And yet, we would have been a staff study. Senator. Right. I, so I guess I sort of thought of it as falling under the purview of taxes generally as a subject matter issue. And I guess that this was referring specifically to, to um, personal taxes, right? Director. Or business taxes. Right. And that's, um, as Hannah was saying, we, we try to tailor the, the legislative, legislative update to um, legislation related to uh, past TASR studies and in, 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 in most cases recently past studies, though sometimes we reach a little bit further back. Commissioner Thomas, thank you for your patience. Thank you very much for your presentation. Just a question of clarity, and if it's premature to, um, to Melissa's presentation, I will absolutely hold. But on the child care uh, request for study, will that include the intersectionality of the workforce development efforts to expand early child um, Childhood workers, child care workers as well. So programs that are earn and learn based for child care workers. Will that component be included in this at all? Yes. So the second part, the public chapter 934, um, that portion of the study is going to include some discussion of the benefits cliff and programs like wages, for example, um, if you're familiar with that, that um, provide incentives for child care workers to come into the, for the workforce or into that industry and to stay in that industry. Just, just a quick follow-up. I'm very familiar, but I know there are programs like uh, we uh, in Tennessee have implemented um, early uh, childhood apprenticeship programs for child care workers. So if that's not included, I would just encourage you to perhaps include that as well because it allows for the earn and learn while they're getting the necessary certification. So that's why I raised that point. Great. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, and that's definitely the purview of it. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Ms. Newcomb. Any other questions from the Commission? Executive. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. On page four, the GPS monitoring uh, legislation, who pays for that? The, the monitor and the, and the maintenance agreements that go along with the monitoring. Was that set out? That's a great question, and I actually don't have the answer for you today, but I'd be happy to look into it and right. get back to you. On page five, uh, Public Chapter 956, Acts of 2024, the Industrial Development Boards with expected high job growth. Uh, how is high job growth defined? Do you have any idea? Is there a specific data set that you have to exceed in order to qualify? Or can any Industrial Development Board say, we expect high job growth and qualify? That's also a good question. I would defer to Dr. Strickland. Um, who may have more information for you on that. But I could get that call. later, right? I mean, right, I, yeah. okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Williams, you recognize? Thank you. Just to follow up the <clears throat> county executive, but the, the state has an indigent fund that helps pay for a portion of the GPS mon monitoring systems, which 
uh, it runs woefully short every every year. There are several counties that um, gobble up most of those funds, but those uh, folks that have been sure. charged with those crimes sometimes uh, fit the bill for those as well. Uh, I did want to follow up on uh, the question earlier regarding uh, Representative Hardaway, uh, uh, and I have been working diligently as it relates to forensics. The reason why that bill didn't pass the House is because there was a will within the House for us to, which it didn't have five. The will was when the House was, if Tasser was going to go to the great extent to study uh, the subject matter, we wanted to make sure that we had did a fiduciary responsibility of managing what the what the need would be across the state in case that. Uh, obviously, currently uh, in, in Shelby County, Memphis, there's a, a great demand for forensic lab and crime lab there, uh, particularly based upon the amount of offenders of, of crimes there. <clears throat> but we also wanted to look and see what would be the next best second place to do that and prioritize that as it relates to funding. So it wasn't, uh, from the House's perspective, it wasn't as if we didn't want to study it. We just wanted it to be broader than the current language of the bill that was before us. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Any other comments or questions from the Commission? Director Lippert, did you have a follow-up? All right. Ms. Newcomb, thank, thank you. you. That takes us to tab five, that is Moose Brown. Welcome back. And I understand we will be doing some voting. Yes, thank you. And uh, again, Melissa Brown, Deputy Executive Director. Um, so behind tab five, we're going to be looking at the work program amendment and new research plans. And I will say it's hard to parse apart our accomplishments, the legislative update, and the work program amendments because they, they overlap quite a bit. So you've already had some really great questions and suggestions for us. So tab five, uh, the memo is divided into two main sections. The first, I'm gonna give you a quick update of where we are on the projects that are currently on the work program. <coughs> And then the second are, is going to be the items for consideration to add to the work program this year. There's three broad amendments, uh, and we'll get to those in a moment. Uh, this covers several studies that have been sent our way. I do want to note that behind tab five is a series of lettered tabs. So A through H, those are the draft research plans for each of the proposed studies. Now, tab H is for the rolling stock project that was added to the work program in January, but we did want to bring that to you so you could see it. But everything else is a proposed research plan for the proposed studies. So going to page one of the memo, the status of the existing work program projects first, the annual infrastructure report you approved at your January 2024 meeting. Staff is already collecting data and vetting it for next year's report. The annual TVA report was also presented and approved at your January 2024 meeting. The next report will be presented in January of 2025 to meet the legislature's deadline for February 28th, 2025. Next is the fiscal capacity index. Uh, Presley Powers will be presenting this year's model with an, and the update on the model and its results. But the information has already been sent to the State Board of Education, the State Department of Education, and the Controller of the Treasury. The next index won't be due until May 1st of 2025. Next is a new item that's a recurring project for TASSER, although we haven't had to take action quite yet. Under Public Chapter 341 Acts of 2023, this relates to tangible personal property. The Public Chapter passed and takes effect July 1 of 2024. And so what it did is add additional certification tiers that allow smaller businesses to file and pay their personal property tax without taking all that time to itemize uh, all of their property. So part of the act is for uh, the task or commission to monitor and periodically report on the effect of this act. So we have to wait for it to be implemented. There'll be a, a year of reporting under that for us to have data to analyze and to bring you an updated report. Next is housing affordability. And once again, Dr. Mike Strickland's name is going to be invoked. He will be presenting later this afternoon that final report. Uh, it was by House Joint Resolution 139 by Representative Sparks and Dr. Strickland will have the final report this afternoon for your approval. The water wastewater study, which was requested at the commission's January 2023 meeting. Uh, Madison Moffitt will be presenting that uh, tomorrow afternoon under tab 10, uh, the draft report of that. And then finally, the last item that's currently on the uh, work program 
is the research around rolling stock. And again, the, the draft research plan is behind tab H. And then the team has already been leaning into this project and tomorrow has, uh, for tomorrow has put together a panel of experts to testify about some of those issues because what we're already finding is it is not just a local issue, but it's an issue at the state level as well. Turning to page three, and Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna look to you for guidance on how you wanna proceed here. So there's three amendments. Uh, the first amendment uh, covers a few studies that passed in both chambers. The second amendment includes two bills, each only passing one chamber. And then the third includes a study requested by letter from Senator Lundberg and Representative Sherrill. So, Chairman, would you like for us to go through each of the studies? I do you want to take them as a group? How would you like to do this? I think uh, without objection, we could then take each one and have a voice vote. Um, we still have a quorum, so without objection, if that's okay with you. Oh. <laughs> at the will of the committee. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So the first the first study adds a bill requested by Senate Bill 1140 by Senator Lundberg and House Bill 886 by uh, Representative Hawk. And it passed both chambers. It just hasn't received a public chapter yet. And this is to study uh, the remittance of state and local taxes, including sales and use taxes, uh, collected at the point of sale by businesses in Tennessee. And then there's a series of questions, specific questions for the study to address. And this study has a due date of January 31 of 2025. And I did forget to note that behind each research plan uh, is a copy of the legislation, but also a timeline for the completion of the project. I forgot to mention that. All right. So that is um, a proper amendment, due date January 31, 2025. We can have a voice vote from the commission. All in favor to accept this amendment one for a study, please say aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. This amendment has been accepted. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, next is a study. This is related to public chapter 937, acts of 2024, related to the effects of vaping and the use of all vapor products by persons under 21 years of age. Uh, there's also a series of questions here that the study is to address, and the due date is January, also January 31st of 2025. All right. Uh, that is, again, an amendment. Um, that's actually 1B, I think we should call it. It is. It is. Amendment 1B. All in favor to accept Amendment 1B, say aye. aye. Opposed, like sign. It has also been accepted. Thank you, madam. Going, going with your system 1C is going to be a study related to child care. And this is requested by two separate pieces of legislation, which Hannah did a great job of, of describing in the legislative update. So it addresses public chapter 938, acts of 2024, to study uh, state and local laws, regulations, and rules that govern uh, all aspects of child care businesses in Tennessee. Going on to page four of the memo, it addresses, uh, it outlines specific questions and issues to be addressed. And then next, uh, the public chapter 934, Acts of 2024. Uh, this is to study a series of questions and issues related, uh, the research plan is in page five, tab five, about child care workers. And that gets at the issues of compensation and the benefits cliff. And commissioner, some of the issues that you were raising earlier. Um, so if you see something in that research plan that we have missed, please let us know. We can add that there. Um, so we're, we're combining those two. Um, and that also has a due date of January 31st, 2025. Thank you, Madam Executive, Deputy Executive Director. It's a uh <laughs> Looks like January of 2025 will be a very busy season for yes. the task. Yes, uh, this summer is going to be really, staff? summer right. and fall is going to be busy for staff. And I'm thankful that you did include the comments and concerns from Commissioner Thomas under that last. Yes. So that is uh, Amendment 1C. If there's no objection uh, by the commission, let's vote. All in favor of adopting Amendment 1C, say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. Those three have all been adopted. Thank you. And then the next one under the first amendment is public chapter 941, acts of 2024, which directs the commission to study real estate fraud. And uh, there is no due date for this one specified in the public chapter. All right, so there are two under amendment two. Is that what? Oh, we still need to do the, the real estate fraud. Got it, real estate fraud, all right. My apologies, all in favor of accepting this amendment. 
with no due date. Yes. Open ended. A little, favor, little bit of flexibility. There. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed like sign. The ayes aye. have it. We have one vote in opposition. The ayes have it. The amendment has been adopted. Thank you, madam. And now we're on to amendment two. And uh, each one of these only passed one chamber of the legislature. So we'll definitely look at these separately. The first study at the bottom of page four would add a study requested by Senate Bill 2877 by Kyle and House Bill 2961 by Hardaway. Now that this bill passed the Senate but not the House, and this is the one that I believe Representative Williams spoke to earlier about uh, looking at Shelby County Crime Lab, but also e expanding that study, making that a little more broad than just looking at Shelby County. And if I've misstated that, please, please correct me. Uh, and on this one, continuing on the top of page five, uh, no due date is specified. All right, Chairman Williams, you had a question? Thank you, thank you for including that. I do think it's important that we understand what the, it looks across the state. I do. Uh, just as a clarifying question, the previous one we adopted uh, did not have a due date. Is there a, is there a, an end date for those without due dates? Uh, or, or so, uh, I guess the question is, I've been in communication with Representative Hardaway regarding the one before us now, and the, the hope was that before we left session in May of next year, we might have some kind of idea, is, so that I can manage expectations from the, my fellow colleagues do do we think there's a probability that would be by May 20 uh, or mid-April 2025 or? Director Lippert, I'll let you. I don't want to overload the wagon, which is why we didn't pass all the TASSER bills instead of in front of us. But. Right. And just one second, Chairman. I'm checking the research plan just to make sure I don't misspeak here. So the the the, the plan on, nope, that's the wrong one, sorry. I'm showing it would be Amendment 2A. And it's going to be Tab E is yes. the, yeah, proposed. I had to look to myself too quick. Yeah, and it's the same. Uh, so the the intent, uh, our, our planning timeline for it now, Chairman Williams, is to have a, a draft report to the commission in May, which means we'll have had some form of update, uh, possibly a panel and, and, and some other information for the commission before probably at the, that January meeting. Okay. Um, we And when we... When we have a, a report like that, that comes to us without a due date, we, we love that because we can kind of plug in and around. So there, there's a there's the possibility it could something could be done sooner on it if other studies aren't as intensive as we expect them to be. But okay, it's, it's very rare for a study to be less intensive than we expect it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's like a pilot a pilot project that never worked. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Chair. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mayor Frank. Yes, thank you. Uh, just on that particular item, on your work plan, is it possible to add the medical examiner? I know like Knox Region Medical Examiner uh, is a great resource and um, would like input on on that particular. And work. this is on the crime lab? Yes. Ab absolutely. We can add okay. that in. And then just to ensure Representative Williams did ask for it, but it will, we are looking at the entire state. Yes, okay. broad, broad study. Okay, good, not, thank you. Not just Shelby County, yes. Okay, thank you. And Director Lippert? And, and that, that's a good opportunity to just add, as a general comment, if there's ever anybody, when you're looking through the research plans or even just you know, driving home and you need to think of something, anyone you think we should talk to about one of the studies, please let us know um, because we, we try to be as exhaustive as we can in our list of stakeholders that we interview, but there's, I mean, there's almost always someone else that we, we could talk to. So please let us know. And if you f see anything in the research plans, we've already had someone reach out to us about uh, a technical issue with one of the research plans where they think it, one of the things isn't exactly right, which that happens too. These are, these are, the research plans are living documents, so we continue to update and edit them as, as we go through. So if you, if you see anything that, you, that just doesn't make sense in a research plan, let us know that also. Thank you, Director. All right, as I am working my way through, sorry, Mr. Peach. I just wanted to echo, uh, including the forensics uh, with pathology, uh, for sure, include I know crime lab is something totally different than the than the pathology, but I do believe we're at a critical state here for a lot of counties going to the same places, and they're they're not using. All right, 
Any other comments or questions? Uh, Ms. Brown, is it, as I already say, it's Amendment 2A yes. is where we are now. And if there are no other comments or questions from the commission, we'll all in favor to adopt Amendment 2A say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. The ayes have it. We will adopt Amendment 2A. Now we're at the top of page five, which will be 2B. This would add a study by Senate Bill 2054 uh -huh. by Jackson and House Bill 2205 by Barrett. Now this house passed the, it passed the house, but was referred to task for, uh, for study by the Senate Finance Ways and Means Committee. Uh, this, so the original bill, the original bill that passed was just a, a bill to amend state statute. Uh, it wasn't sent as a tasser study. That was just in a, a voice motion. But what the original bill would have done would allow the district attorney general to only prosecute cases in municipal court where the mun municipality provides sufficient additional prosecutorial personnel and empowers the DEA, the DEA, the DA, I'm so sorry, with the sole and exclusive discretion in determining the necessity and sufficiency of additional personnel. And then the bill also specifies that the DA has absolute discretion to use in the performance of the duties and responsibilities. And on this one, there is no due date specified. No due date specified right. on item 2B. Any comments or questions or concerns from the commission on this amendment? All right, seeing none, all in favor of adopting 2B say aye. aye. Opposed, like sign, it is adopted. And then the last amendment, it would add a study requested via mm -hmm. letter to Chairman Yeager that is related to Senate Bill 2487 by Lundberg and House Bill 2616 by Cheryl, which asks for a study of school-based services for 10 care. All right, and also as the others previously, no due date. Correct. All right, so this is Amendment 3. It's a standalone amendment. Any comments or questions from the commission? Seeing none. All in favor of accepting Amendment 3 to the workload, say aye. Aye. Opposed, like sign. And the ayes have it. They have all been adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations. All right. Thank you for working through the work program and those amendments. It's now time for tab six, which is fiscal capacity for fiscal year 2024-25. Ms. Presley Powers, Senior Research Associate. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Presley Powers, and I will be providing the annual report on fiscal capacity. Just to briefly begin by providing an overview of the TISA or Tennessee Investment and in Student Achievement Act funding formula. It's comprised of four components, and we will discuss each of them, beginning with the two that are equalized or where fiscal capacity is applied. That is the base and weight funding amounts. Uh, the base funding is a fixed dollar amount of funding per student, which for fiscal year 24-25 has been set to $7,075 per student. We also have weighted funding, um, which is provided based on individual needs. Weights are presented as a percentage of the base funding amounts as specified in Tennessee Code Annotated Section 49-3-105. As I mentioned, these are the components where fiscal capacity is applied and fiscal capacity allocates the local contribution among the counties for the base and weight funding. This is calculated by taking an average of the TASSER and the SEBER models. Next, we have direct and outcome funding, which are 100% funded by the state and therefore not equalized. Direct funding provides allocations for students enrolled in public charter schools and certain students participating in high impact strategic programming. We also have outcome funding, which provides funding based on student outcomes. We have a few examples of those listed on the screen, such as third and fourth grade literacy. To begin our discussion of fiscal capacity, fiscal capacity essentially answers the question, how much must each local government contribute? It's done by taking a measure of the potential ability of local governments to fund education from their own taxable sources relative to the cost of providing services. It's a county level model, which means all systems within each county pay the same percentage of their TISA allocation. 
to discuss the methodology for calculating fiscal capacity. A set of averages are drawn from actual tax bases, income, and a number of other variables, which we'll discuss in just a moment, and is compared with actual revenue. The amount of weight to give each factor is determined by estimating the statistical relationship between them. And it's uh, calculated by taking a, um, or using a multiple regression analysis, which is a common statistical method used to understand relationships among factors for a wide range of issues. While simultaneously comparing all variables for all counties to determine how much weight to give each or to give each factor, I apologize. Weights are multiplied by the factor for each county to estimate potential local revenue for each of the 95 counties. We use actual revenue as a control or our, our Y variable. Some factors used in TASSER's fiscal uh, capacity regression. We have own source revenue per student. This is the actual amount of money local governments raise to fund their students, divided by enrollment or average daily membership, which you will frequently see abbreviated to ADM. The control, this is the control factor that keeps the estimates within the bounds of what local governments actually do. Sales tax base per student, this is the locally taxable sales for county area divided by ADM. This is a measure of the local ability to raise revenue. Equalized property assessment per student, this is the total assessed property value for the county area, equalized across counties using appraisal to sales ratios and then divided by ADM. This is also a measure of the local ability to raise revenue. Commercial property is assessed at 40%, while residential property is assessed at 25%. This means that property changing from residential to commercial assessment, for example, short-term rental cabins, increase the county's total property assessment, thus increasing its fiscal capacity. In the TASSER model, the residential and farm assessment, which we'll discuss in a moment, is used as a percentage of the total estimate um, would decrease, also increasing the county's fiscal capacity. Equalized residential and farm assessment divided by total equalized assessment is the measure of, residential, of the residential tax burden and the total taxable value of all residential and farm property divided by the total taxable value of all property in the county. It's a proxy for a county's potential ability to export taxes through business activity. The higher this number, the lower the level of business activity and the higher the risk of heavy tax burden on county residents. Per capita income is a proxy for counties county residents' ability to pay for education and all other local revenue not otherwise accounted for by property or sales taxes. The service responsibility is measured by dividing the total number of students in public schools by the entire population as reported by the U.S. Census Bureau to use as a reflection of spending needs. The larger the number of public school students per 100 residents, the greater the fiscal burden for each taxpayer. To discuss the um, intended or expected effects of changes in fiscal capacity factors, when factors such as the property tax base, uh, sales tax base, or per capita income increase, we expect to see fiscal capacity increase as well. Whereas with factors such as residential and farm share of property and the service responsibility, as these things increase, we expect to see your fiscal capacity decrease. Oh, so sorry. Um, county trends in the share of statewide fiscal capacity. The change in a county's share of statewide fiscal capacity depends on its growth in fiscal capacity relative to the state's overall growth in fiscal capacity. Um, in other words, it's a zero sum. We've depicted here on the screen a map of the state with each of the 95 counties. Those highlighted in green are trending upward, those in yellow are holding steady, and those in blue are trending downward. Uh, to, to kind of um, help depict um, fiscal capacity relative to the state or, or the 95 counties, we have uh, here Hamilton County, which is highlighted in red, and the state of Tennessee in blue. At first glance, you may look and say, hey, both of these lines are trending upward, so fiscal capacity must be trending upward, uh, when in reality, the Hamilton County line you'll see is below that of the state, which actually means their fiscal capacity is trending downward. You can also see in previous years, where uh, the two were holding more steady, to, just to help kind of visualize that effect. 
As fiscal capacity for a county decreases, the other 94 counties are responsible for a greater share of the TISA local contribution. Um, and to discuss some updates to the variables used in the TASSER model, uh, to be clear, these are updates per, um, that were done in our source data, not TASSER to its own model. Uh, but the Bureau of Economic Analysis, or the BEA, made a change in its methodology for estimating personal income. This is used in the index as the per capita income variable. Unemployment benefits, which are counted as income, are now estimated uh, based on the number of unemployed people in a county rather than a state or local office reporting to the BEA due to issues with timely reporting. Unemployment compensation decreased, uh, b the benefits decreased by 98% from 2020 to 2022. Uh, following decreases in unemployment rates and federal aid, uh, making per capita income, the per capita income variable return to more of a pre-pandemic norm. We have a recommendation uh, for changes to the TASSER fiscal capacity model. TASSER recommends replacing the tax equivalent payment data in its model with the Industrial Development Board assessment data. Uh, CBER already includes this data in its model. And since it was first developed, TASSER's model has included tax equivalency payments to capture the assessed value of property subject to pilot agreements. Initially, this data was made available from the Comptroller's Office, but it has not been updated uh, since 1995. We have other considerations uh, for the TASSER fiscal capacity model, things that we're monitoring. Um, these include counting virtual school students, monitoring the service responsibility factor, and transitioning to a school system level model. We'll discuss each of these in detail in the following slides. Virtual school students, the enrollment in virtual schools affects fiscal capacity. Holding all else equal, as enrollment in virtual schools increases, the fiscal capacity index of counties that operate virtual schools decreases increasing their state funding while decreasing state funding for counties with less or no enrollment in virtual schools. In terms of fiscal capacity, virtual school students increase the service responsibility without contributing to other factors such as the sales and property tax bases. We have defined here um, what a virtual school is. It's a public school in which the school uses technology in order to deliver a significant portion of instruction to its students via the internet, uh, in a virtual or remote setting. For the purpose of fiscal capacity, students are counted as enrolled in the school system where the virtual school is located. Fiscal capacity is calculated at the county level, so each school system within the, county, within the same county is treated as though they have the same fiscal capacity. Local boards of education may admit students from outside their respective local school districts at any time, and participation in a virtual education program by a student shall be at the discretion of the school system in which the student is enrolled or zoned to attend. Within the state of Tennessee, we have 58 virtual schools. 27 only accept students from that school system. 12 accept students from surrounding areas in addition to students from that school system. And we have 19 that allow students from across the state. Currently, Union and Johnson counties have the largest statewide virtual school enrollment. All else being equal, the effect of including their virtual school students in the fiscal capacity calculations decreases fiscal capacity, which increases state funding for Union and Johnson counties and decreases state funding for the other 93 counties. We've depicted here on the screen Union County's local revenue per student. You'll see the blue line is Union County's revenue um, per ADM, and the red line is what that would be without virtual school students. We have the same information here for Johnson County. Next, um, to discuss monitoring the service responsibility factor. The influence of the service responsibility variable or average daily membership divided pop by population has decreased to the point um, where in some years it has inadvertently increased fiscal capacity for counties with greater service responsibility and decreased their state funding. Next, transitioning to a school system level model. 
A school system level model would take into account uh, intra-county disparities, such as a county's relative lack of access to unshared tax bases and the concentration of commercial and industrial tax bases within cities which leaves counties with less ability to raise local revenue for county school systems when compared with city school systems and special school districts in the same county. Calculating fiscal capacity at the school system level can decrease these disparities while still adhering to principles of taxpayer equity. That concludes my presentation and I can now open the floor to questions. Thank you very much. Any questions from the members of the Commission, Representative Williams. Thank you. I'm obviously great work. I'm a little bit confused, so hopefully you can help me. So it was my understanding that in Putnam County we have virtual schools. Uh, particularly, it started uh, the virtual school system started because we could provide uh, a higher uh, academic standard in certain subject matters that that wouldn't be available at one high school, but they would in what we would consider the more central high school where more kids go. So we offered virtual options for those kids. Uh, in that instance, it's my understanding that the, the state dollar and the local dollar, because they're all in Putnam County, are following the child wherever they're uh, currently residing. Because of those additional resources available to Putnam County students, other surrounding counties, particularly White County, has said we would love for our kids to be able to take some of those classes because we had tech professors who were teaching those classes. They could do that. I guess my question is I'm trying to understand the impact. I recognize Union and Johnson County because those are kind of hubs for all students across the state. Did you take into consideration the regionality of that as it relates to, say, in the Upper Cumberland where a student from White County may come, that local dollar, it's my understanding, doesn't follow the child into Putnam County, only the state dollar does. Uh, but it was my understanding that the, the local dollar stayed in White County because that's where the child is registered for school. Is that not what's happening? Um, so, so I can use Putnam and, and Johnson maybe as, as the best kind of points of comparison. I'll also add as a Putnam County um, lifelong resident uh, attended some of those virtual schools yes. and, and can come in the programs. Um, but li like you were saying with Putnam County, that's primarily a in county um, program. It's mm -hmm. not recruiting students from across the state. And like you said, um, for the purpose of fiscal capacity, those students and their families are contributing not only to the service responsibility, but also the local sales and um, property tax bases as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that effect, like you were saying, um, is maybe less evident with a county like like Putnam, um, where where things are are being locally managed. Whereas, say for Johnson County, for instance, um, as you mentioned, those students may be anywhere in the state, uh, but their service responsibility is being concentrated in Johnson County without that same contribution to the the local sales and property tax. Basis and so that that's kind of why why we were wanting to raise that as a point. I got you. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely Senator uh, Thank you, mr. Chair, so um, wow, there are a lot of moving levers here um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind and I if, if the chair doesn't mind taking me through um, a line of this um, 2025 fiscal capacity variables table one Index, just I, what I what I would like to know is is where we're getting our numbers. First of all, for comparison, in the last um, for comparison fiscal year 2024 fiscal cap index, all of these numbers would add up to to, to 100, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so um, Davidson County, for example, <laughs> just picked one out of my hat. Um, <laughs> Can you can you take me through um, this this line by line item? So, like, if we're looking at per pupil revenue, mm -hmm. um, is that per pupil revenue coming from state and local contribution? Um, so we use the the revenue variable as a control variable. I can, it may actually be helpful for me to back up my presentation just a little bit. Yes, that'd um, be great. So we can follow the the variables a little bit easier. Let's see. Okay, let's see here. Okay, yes. Um, 
Let me make it where you all can see it. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> it did not. Okay, there we go. Um, so, yeah, I think this actually follows fairly closely. Um, so, as you mentioned, with, with the revenue variable, we're taking the actual amount of money local governments raise okay. uh, to fund their, their enrollments, and then we put this over the average daily membership to come up with that, that first, the per pupil revenue. And, um, oh, do you mind, Mr. Chair? Uh, uh, um So your, your ADM is coming from the schools, from the LEA, from? Uh, yes, we, it's from the table seven in the annual statistical report put out by the Department of Education. Okay. Um, all right, the rest of this, I guess, makes sense. I'm gonna have to spend some time with it, but, but then just one more question. And that is with our virtual school reporting, is there any kind of a verification follow up on that? I mean, how do we know that we are getting the right numbers in terms of um, being told what, how many virtual students we have? Um, to, to jump back to the Johnson County example, um, that came to our attention in the previous fiscal capacity update uh, from last year because we saw an 80% increase in their ADMs year to year and that kind of flagged us as, hey, we should look a little bit more into this. And since that time, um, we have points of contact with the Department of Education that give us annual updates on the virtual schools for state, the statewide virtual school enrollment, I should say, uh, particularly for Johnson and Union counties as they have the highest number for the state. So just to be clear, we're only tracking Johnson and Union in no, terms no, of No, I apologize. Study? They're just with them having the highest number, they're, they're the best to depict the effect that we're describing here. Uh-huh. Um, yes, Because obviously that seems like it could be a real problem with people misreporting, right? So, I mean... When when we look into that, did we did we see that there were and that there was any misreporting? It, misreporting in terms of like in terms the of the numbers, yes, of, of virtual students. Um, everyone we've talked to has been incredibly cooperative at, at J Johnson Union and across the state, um, as well as at the Department of Education, and they've all provided us with the same information in terms of the student counts. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Trump. Leslie, thank you. I'm going to ask for your patience in advance, okay? <laughs> so going back to Representative Williams' question uh, in Putnam County, if they're taking on students from an adjacent county and serving them virtually is technically not costing them anymore, but the local and the state funding, does it remain in that adjacent county? Because I'm trying to get clarity on what follows the student. So if they are virtually enrolled, the local and the state share remains where that student resides. I'm, I'm trying to get clarity. And if they're serving them in Putnam, wouldn't that have restraints a bit on Putnam and increase the adjacent county's capacity as opposed to it going down? I guess I'm kind of confused as to what the map shows uh -huh. as far as who decreases and increases in fiscal capacity. Can you explain that a little bit? Maybe I'm not asking it just right. Um, I think I'm following, but definitely okay. steer okay. me along if I'm getting okay. off track at all. Um, so the, the map is for fiscal capacity as a whole. It's not um, like the fiscal capacity for just virtual school students. It's overall. Yes. Yeah. The, um, the, sorry, the service responsibility, um, as you're describing with, with the virtual school effect, um, that the map isn't just highlighting that, I should say. Okay. It's, um, so does that part, at least before I move on, does that help a yeah. little bit? Okay. okay. Yeah, that clarifies that part. Um, and, and when we talk about things in terms of trending upward or holding steady or, or trending downward, the, the Hamilton County example, for instance, um, we try to show there how, how things are in relation to that 95 county average, because uh, with fiscal capacity being relative, you know, we're, um, as Senator Campbell mentioned, it all adds up to 100%, right, in, in terms of that local contribution. Um, Okay, did I, I think the, the first part at least. <laughs> I'm, in the, I'm in the car with you so far. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, and then in terms of, um, of virtual school students, when you talk about funding following them, do you mean, um, for instance, like the base? Yes. Okay, yes. 
Um, yes, that, and I can only speak to the, the parts that are equalized because there's, you know, as we know under TISA, there's direct and outcome funding, um, which we, we don't, you know, that, that's 100% state funded, uh, whereas the, for instance, that base amount, that $7,075, yes, that's, that is following the student. Okay. So okay. that, does, okay. Okay. I think that was my, you helped me get back to, I think, you helped add clarity to my okay. question. Okay. <laughs> I think I got Perfect. it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Representative Williams. One, one final question, and, okay. and then I will go back to my office with my big book and read it. So <laughs> define for me, is there anywhere in here a definition of what fiscal capacity is? Because I think that's where I'm missing it. I think I'm, oh, yes. I think I'm looking at it from a completely different angle than what you're looking at. It. Where would that be in, in here if um, it's available? Yes, absolutely. Let me go back. Because I think I'm just on the run, wrong runway. Okay. So um, as, if we're just defining fiscal capacity, we're looking at how much each government or each local government contributes, right? And we do this by taking a measure of um, we use, like I've mentioned a couple times, um, local revenue is, is a control for that. So it's how much much each government contribute. Um, and it's not, I don't want fiscal capacity to seem uh, prescriptive. It's a behavioral model. We're not saying what you have to do. We're taking measures of what can be done. Okay. I follow that. All right. Uh, Representative Williams, did you have a follow-up question? No, Great. Chairman. Thank you very much. County Executive Puffman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Representative Williams has got me confused. Um, <laughs> it, it's not how much the local government's contributing, it's how much it's their capacity to contribute, whether they are or not, though, right? Yes. Right. Okay. So, in the fiscal capacity model, it's still a 50 50 model, right? It's still 50% Dr. Fox, 50% yes. Tasser. Yes, sir. And in the Tasser model, personal income is measured. Yes, sir. In the Fox model, personal income is not considered, just property and sales. Yes, sir. Correct. Yes, sir. I think you should present next year. No, no. <laughs> so, I. Uh, so. so so when, you, when you're looking at the model, first of all, when you're looking at pre-K funding, it's got nothing to do with fiscal capacity, does it? Is pre-K in Tennessee funded based on fiscal capacity at all? I mean, that's completely separate from anything that's that got to do with fiscal capacity, so we're not talking about pre-K at all. If there, and this is my last one, Mr. Chairman, if there is a large industrial uh, success story in Tennessee, uh, let's say uh, Volkswagen, or let's say in Haywood County, let's say that the Ford project that's in an unincorporated area of Haywood County, it, how is the fiscal capacity, uh, how is Haywood County's fiscal capacity measured when you've got a huge investment made in Haywood County on property that Haywood County does not own, but is substantially gonna raise, we believe, the wage rates and the wealth of the people that live not only in Haywood and other counties as well. How, how would you, how in the world would you <laughs> figure what the fiscal capacity of that county and the counties around that are? Um, that's a really excellent question and a far more brilliant mind has joined me. Um, <laughs> but I'll add, you know, as we've discussed or this. Or Volkswagen and H any of them, any. Absolutely, and with, um, what, there are two factors to, to kind of keep in mind when we're thinking about major shifts like that in fiscal capacity. One is that we take three-year averages to kind of smooth out those sudden jolts that, that you're talking about. Um, just to, you know, kind of keep everything um, within reason, so, so to speak. Another is with fiscal capacity being relative, the change in, say, a Haywood County depends on really what's going on in the other 94 counties as well. Uh, so when we're taking that measurement, it's not just to focus on those changes happening in Haywood County, but it's, it's the state as a whole. And if Dr. Or Michael now <laughs> would like to add anything um, to that, I, I certainly welcome any additional well, comments. Well, I guess more specifically, it, just this. Is Haywood County's fiscal capacity 
going to go up or down? Uh, well, <laughs> that was an easy one. Um, I, yeah, the commercial property uh, in, would increase increasing fiscal capacity. I would also add that if there's any payment in lieu of tax agreement, our model um, does not take in to, into uh, account changes in payment in lieu of tax agreements, uh, whereas Seaver model does. It's, all right, so the pilot payments are considered in 50% of the model and the other 50% they're not. We just don't, yeah, we, we include the um, 93, 95 wow. tax equivalent we, payments. We have another uh, joining Director Lippert. And I would add, County Executive Huffman, that the, and Michael's right, uh, that the, the payments in lieu of tax dollars are not included in our model. It's something we've been raising for a couple of years. As a matter of fact, the commission has actually recommended in, in uh, two reports that, that that be modified. We have been in discussions uh, with the old BEP review committee and, and, and um, the other actors involved in fiscal capacity. Uh, and we expect to bring this potential change back up once the TISA review committee stands up here in the next year or so. Uh, there was talk of, of adding the um, adding those pilots, replacing the TEPs, the old TEPs, the 90, 1995 data that's in our model with those. Uh, but with the transition from the BEP to TISA, uh, it was decided to let that kind of process through first, and then we're going to bring this this up through the change process that was put in statute related to, to TISA once the, the TISA Review Committee comes online. County Executive Huffman, follow up? The reason it's concerning is because it it's relative. Everyone, everything is relative, Mr. Chairman, as you know, and we're talking about over a third of a billion dollars in pilot payments over the years from Tier 1 suppliers and folks that are going to be located on the plant. That is a big number for that region, period. But in terms of the rest of the state, uh, I know we have the three-year rolling average, but you know a pilot goes way beyond three years, mm -hmm. and so it's going to be in there for a long time. Just a point. It's thank you, County Executive. It's a great point. I don't know of recent industrial development deals of any kind that a pilot is not included. It just seems to be the upward trend all across the state. But it's whatever the fact is, it's half because what the Fox model does not include it and the TASA model does, correct? The opposite. The, oh, the other TASA way. model does not in yeah, include right. it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Anderson had a comment. Welcome. Thank you. Ms. Powers, thank you very much. Can I retitle your graph 14 that you have up on the slide? that the green counties are supplementing the other. <laughs> <clears throat> would, would you allow me to expound on that a little bit? This may be a time to defer to Dr. Lippert. <laughs> so um, to all of the members here, I say this with all the honesty that I can muster up without getting a little bit riled when I see these type of numbers. The, the Tister plan is is not about how much student, how much the the state is is sending or s starting with with the student. It's the discount at the end. It's like you go shopping for a hundred dollar item. And one place gives you ten percent. One gives you fifteen. Chances are you're going to take the fifteen. Under your capacity for counties to answer your question. Jeff, in about 10 years, you're going to feel the effects of all of the um, investment made, and you're going to see that really heavily in Davidson County over the next couple of years because their sales tax base is going out to the, the top. The, these models that we're seeing, and I'm all for um, 95 minus 21, 74 counties. Um, of the 21 helping the other 74, but when the burden, the capacity is at the local level, and all of these men and women setting up here are elected officials, and they have to raise taxes to make up the physical capacity 
then it becomes problematic, and nobody can understand that. So if you, if you look at the charts that you have here, each of these ladies and gentlemen serve, serve in Nashville, I'm going to be calling my representative to say that in the month of um, late April, I get my new capacity physical numbers from the state of Tennessee that shows me what percentage we're going to lose because our capacity has gone up. And you're pretty close to getting your budget put together by that time. So on our example this year, we came up $2.6 million short, less than we got last year, 2.5 something. All that's on the chart, but you're not presented with this information. Well, it always go, goes back to all the 95 counties. What does a penny generate in your individual county to make that capacity number up? As far as the pre-K, there's nothing. There's no funding there for pre-K in Tennessee. So I don't even really know how to ask you what I want to ask because you've done an excellent job of something that I've been trying to focus on for the last three weeks to better understand it. But I'm afraid the Tissa Mahler is not helping us as great as the BEP did when the, at the end of the day. Now, I know there's people in this audience who would disagree with me on that. But... Um, I think all of our representatives in Nashville need to really dig into this, whether it's the cyber model, the Fox model, or any other model, and understand what what they're doing to the what what is actually happening in your school district. And this idea about one child going from one county to the next, and the money not following them. So I really believe there will be a lot of abuse of that. That, that a child that can't get that education, if one system is not performing the way they should by the parent's model, then I'm going to send my children over to a county that's performing so that I can get out of there, get a job, and get back home so that they can go to work. You're just nodding with me, aren't you? <laughs> so that's, I don't, I just, it's very deep. You're not, this is, and I will add, just to your point about fiscal capacity, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, in terms of the TISA model, one of the, the major changes with fiscal capacity is it's only being applied to base and weight funding. Um, fiscal, it, the um, direct and outcome funding is, does not have fiscal capacity applied and is 100% state funded. Uh, so there are components uh, in what may be a, a change in your funding that we, as as TASSER, can't speak to because that's not where our model's been applied. Would you would you allow me just to name me something in our capitalistic society that we have that we get penalized for being successful? Talk about equalization or uh, just I, I thank you very much for, for these comments. I agree with you, of course. And I mean, in a zero sum kind of situation where we're not really dealing with free capitalistic um, activity to put a big Mac index on, on, on these markets is not um, not fair and um, and and certainly trends in a very bad direction for um, for the um, the green counties, so um, I just wanted to thank the mayor for for making that point. I couldn't agree more. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a question I already know the answer to, but I still feel the need to ask it. In calculating fiscal capacity and the conversation we have around it, there is not much, if any, consideration given to debt of that county or city. So when you're talking about investment, when you're talking about uh, money that's being spent to grow these counties and cities, I think when we say fiscal capacity, uh, and I'll, if I can, Bishop Brawl for a minute here, that's like me saying to my congregants on Sunday, I know how much you can give, but it's kind of unfair because I'm not considering how much 
they may owe on mortgage and on, on car notes. And so when we talk about places like Nashville, other places that are growing also, there's also a lot of debt. And, and it's kind of unfair when we have this conversation about fiscal capacity, because the assumption is that we can pay more because property tax are going up and uh, housing costs are going up. And so I'll ask my question that I do in order to answer too. When we look at fiscal capacity, do we consider in either model uh, debt that is owed or has to be paid by that city or county? No, sir. Thank you. I just have a question on um, page 16, the virtual school students. I'm, I'm not understanding. So you have enrollment in virtual schools affects fiscal capacity. In terms of fiscal capacity, virtual school students increase the service responsibility without contributing to other factors such as the sales and property tax bases. So is that the only the only impact, the property tax and sales tax, that's how you're making the judgment that it's affecting fiscal capacity. Um, I think, let me, if I can, so, I'm sorry, I'm trying to track every, with the slides. It's, yeah, it's that third bullet down um, on, it says virtual school students. I was trying to see if I had the slide. Way, that's way down on. Well, I think this oh, okay. is the best. Okay. So, I mean, I guess I'm looking at it from just like, you know, um. <laughs> more of a pragmatic level. Okay, I'm, yes. I'm budgeting for my local schools. Um. And, you know, I, you're saying that it, that it affects fiscal capacity. If I get more virtual students, just a higher level, I look at it and go, huh, I get more virtual students, I get more money from the state. It drives my fiscal capacity down. Mm -hmm. um, what are the other, and, 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 you know, to Representative Love's question about debt, you know, is it better for my system to have virtual students? Is that really a negative um, on fiscal capacity? Um, you know, there's a whole lot tied into that, and I guess I'm wanting to understand a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's I, new. I think if I could draw everyone's attention to the slide eight where we show the effects of changes in fiscal capacity factors, that might be the best way to kind of demonstrate this relationship in terms of the virtual school students. Um, you'll see that service responsibility variable. It's the last variable on that chart. And you can see as it increases, which is what's happening with this increased enrollment in virtual schools, as you mentioned, fiscal capacity decreases without um, then also having any contribution to the increase or decrease in these other variables that you see here, such as property and sales. Um, so it's a difficult measurement. Um, and Michael, please jump in if, if there's anything you can add to that context. But, but is that for only students that are outside of your county? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We're talking that- So uh, there, but there can be virtual students inside your county. Yes. In which case, are we differentiating or do we have the data for who's in county virtual and who's out of county, like yeah. the numbers? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, the Department of Education has a, a really useful contact that has provided uh, Michael and I with the virtual school data for, for the state, um, and that, that's how we've been able to, to model some of the effects, such as the ones we showed for Union and Johnson. Um, and I, I believe there were 19 statewide virtual schools that are really the ones that are kind of contributing to that effect that we're discussing, the um, increase in service responsibility without the, the corresponding contributions to the other factors. Okay. And then this is just not related to fiscal capacity, but it's just a curiosity question. If a student from outside the county is enrolled in a virtual school, um, are they eligible for athletics inside the the county that's offering the virtual schooling? So if if I'm in Anderson County and I have, you know, 20 students from all other counties, do they get to play athletics or sports or participate in in that inside Anderson County? Uh, that I'm honestly not sure about, um, but I'm happy to look more into it and get. I, you I was just curious. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely.
Ms. Powers, you did an admirable job. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We will now transition to tab number seven. It is how joint Joint Resolution 139, Housing Affordability Impact Fees Development Taxes. It is a final report for the Commission's approval and will require a vote uh, once Dr. Strickland has presented the report. Thank you, Dr. Strickland. Thank you. And good afternoon, Commissioners. So this is, as noted, the final report on housing affordability, which is being submitted for your approval and which you will find behind tab seven of your docket books. This report was prepared in response to House Joint Resolution 139 by Representative Sparks, introduced last year, which requested a study of housing affordability in Tennessee. Since the presentation of the draft in January, staff have added material to address questions raised by commission members, including in response to several questions from Mayor Frank, some information on homelessness, and people residing in campgrounds, which is to be found on page 22. Information on permitting fees and possible legal limitations on how they may, might be set was added on page 60. Staff also spoke with a representative of Clayton Homes and add further information on manufactured housing and some of the barriers to its use in Tennessee, which is to be found starting on page 68. And in response to a question from Mayor Waters, Appendix E was added giving more detailed breakdowns of vacancy rates in each county. Now, while the General Assembly was in session this year, and as you heard during the legislative update, there were quite a few bills considered that relate to housing affordability in some way. And in light of those, some of the report's recommendations were slightly adjusted. A finding in the draft report that concerned allowing local governments to make multi-year funding commitments to affordable housing projects which is uh, similar, as you may recall, to a program that was launched in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, was enacted by Senate Bill 1137, House Bill 1229, which authorizes local governments to fund industrial development boards for multifamily affordable housing, uh, subject to some conditions set by the Comptroller. Two other recommendations that involved uh, using the realty transfer and mortgage tax revenue were revised to clarify that other revenue sources could also be considered Namely, those were the recommendations to incentivize zoning reform and to fund THDA's housing trust fund for the purpose of making low or zero interest construction loans. A third recommendation was slightly revised following discussion with property assessors. The draft report recommended one method for mitigating the effects of zoning reform on existing residents in a community. Later discussion with the property assessors then led to another option of letting local governments use tax credits instead but the essence of the recommendation remains the same. The three remaining recommendations from the draft report remain unchanged, these being to authorize all local governments to create land banks, to allow local governments to post links to any surplus real property they may have on the state's website for surplus property, and that to prevent the loss of construction employment during economic downturns, the state could reserve funding for infrastructure in ways that smooth out the ups and downs of the business cycle. But that uh, concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have, but would ask for your approval of the report. Thank you, Dr. Strickland, for that report. And uh, any questions or comments from the commission prior to a vote? Mayor Anderson? If, if, and I don't know the answer to this, Michael. If you put some land in a land bank, which our county cannot do, we're not authorized to do that. Can you get it out of the land bank other than for housing? Uh, yes, so under the statute that was created for land banks, there's a broad range of uses that you can put those to. Uh, hope housing is just one of those, but it could be used for other things. As a follow-up, sure. could you, let's say you, um, we're able to put something by the interstate five or 10 years later, could you take that out for ECD? Uh, possibly, I would need to double check. I believe you can, yeah. I can. Yeah. And personal, uh, we, we just, City of Cleveland, I think we're either the fourth or the fifth that we're now legally allowed uh, 
uh, to have a land bank, and we have already begun the process, and it has already become already positive in just a very short few months. So I, I concur wholeheartedly with the recommendation of every county should be allowed to do this because I think it is going to be a, a great tool in the toolboxes for both cities and counties uh, going forward in the state of Tennessee. I wholeheartedly commend and agree with that recommendation. Um, all right. Any other comments or questions from the commission? We have a request to vote and accept the final report for approval under tab seven, House Joint Resolution 139. All right. I, we have a motion from Senator Lumberg. We have a second. Second, second from County Executive Huffman. All right. That's a proper motion, properly second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, like signed. That final approval has been adopted. Thank you for your work, sir. Thank you. And uh, Director Lippard, it is eight minutes before the hour of three. The only thing uh, I have, Mr. Chairman, is any of you who are still using docket books, I don't know, if, uh, you can leave those here, uh, <laughs> and, they, and you can leave them in the room. Uh, they'll be okay overnight. Would and not recommend leaving your iPad. It, no. Uh, and we will uh, reconvene at, at 8.30. All right. Unless there's any other comments or questions from the commission, we will be adjourned until 8.30.